so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, someone who I thought was retired. I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought, uh, I thought he was phasing out. Okay, so, so Mark Justine is. Um, you guys have read some of the, some of the, his articles. The when we talked about um, uh, pre Katrina and some of the the stories about what could happen if, right? Those types of stuff. So he's been working on these types of. Um, uh, coastal issues and environmental issues and related stuff for um, quite a long time. Um, uh, we first uh, reached out to him, I don't know, like right after the storm, and um, and he was very kind to uh, uh, speak to us uh, basically every year, always finds time. Um, in addition to talking about uh, Katrina, he also was a, was a, a major uh, Uncoverer of what was going on with the Deepwater Horizon and many of the other things, and, and I'm sure he'll mention it. But there's another revelation that just came out today about, or yesterday, or this weekend about the flood control um, uh, system, the, the the revised, improved, new and improved, quote unquote, uh, flood control system uh, post um, post Katrina that the Corps was to put in. Um, but in general, uh, he's been on it. He's been on it. In addition to being a reporter for the, when we first met at the Times Picayune and then NOLA.com, and now the advocate slash Times Picayune owned by the, the advocate. And so we can, he, can explain, he can explain that all to you. But in addition to that, he's also a big um, um, player, member, contributor of the Society for Environmental Journalists, which is a really cool organization. Um, that really serves to try to um, help bring more of the, uh, make more connections, you correct me if I'm wrong, make more connections between reporters and the actual scientists so we can have better sort of reporting about the environmental issues that are going on in a more sophisticated way. Um, and he has um, helped bring some of those funds here to New Orleans to support um, his, the, his, his next generation of reporters, to, to bring in the, the next generation of people covering these issues. And uh, yeah, and all that kind of fantastic stuff. I don't know what else to say, but um, but March lives. There you go. So, uh, there was confusion about who I work for. Yes, that was my me and and my people. <laughs> uh, so let me try to explain that first. So um, you guys mostly West Coast, mm -hmm. right? So you know the Portland Oregonian is owned by the. Uh, Advanced Publications, Newhouse Penguin, based in New York, uh, Newark, New Jersey, New York. They own the Newark Star Ledger, the Cleveland Flame Dealer. They used to own the Times Picayune. Um, and as part of their long term strategy, they decided that they wanted to go all digital. Um, and so the first step to doing that was they made us a three day a week home delivery paper. 24-7 online and cut our staff by two-thirds, okay, all at once. This is what, like 2013? That was 20, 2012. 2012. And, um, and the community went ballistic and they tried to get the owner of the Saints to buy the paper and the, the, the U.S. family would not sell it. So another guy in town decided that he wanted to get into, the, into this issue of Home delivery of daily newspapers, print editions, and all that. So he bought the Baton Rouge newspaper and then created a New Orleans edition. Um, and uh, he has been very successful at that. Um, he, is a, um, he has lots of other businesses, including uh, video poker. He's, uh, he owns video poker machines in the state. So he's you know, pretty good in his basement. But he's, he's, a, he's a good businessman has pretty much stayed hands off on the news uh, side of it, but has made sure that we kept going, uh, even through COVID. So it's been pretty big, even though it's other businesses were also significantly hit by COVID. Um, so, uh, in, so he started that edition in 2014. Uh, fast forward to 2019, and, and uh, the New House family just had enough. So they pulled out, they literally closed the newspaper and laid off the entire staff. And they sold the name and some of the assets to the present owner. Um, and our team applied uh, for uh, positions here. And so they hired about, they ended up hiring about 20 people from uh, the old newspaper. 
that their newspaper already had lots of people who had been laid off over the years or who left the paper because they didn't like what was happening and wanted to, to try to move over here. So it's largely lots of people that I used to work for are working for again. Um, our team, um, we got a, a I, I arranged to get a grant through the Walton Family Foundation to pay for two reporters in addition to myself, not for me originally, as well as that they would tell us what to do, which it, it never has. And that's one of the ironies. I mean, one of the reasons why I got involved with them in the first place. So um, when the, by the time we got to the point where the paper was being shut down, we were four reporters, me, who was paid for by, at that time, the Times Picayune, you, uh, and then three reporters under uh, Grant. Uh, we moved the entire team here, um, and then the year after we got here, uh, they put me under the Grant too, so they're not paying for me. Oh wow, so that's good. oh wow. So, so that's, you know, it's good for them, it's okay for me. Um, and uh, so we've been, been doing that work. Um, and that will continue, that grant continues for another uh, end of this year and then next year full time and then we'll see what happens after that. Um, so I, I've been here since 1984 and have been covering uh, environment most of the time. Uh, there were a couple of times when I got pulled off to do projects that had nothing to do with the environment. Um, and also got pulled off to cover the mayor's office and the city council for a year. Uh, but ended up back covering the environment at the end of all that time. And from the very beginning, I've been covering uh, both the levee system and um, coastal restoration issues. So that's you know sort of sort of where I'm at. Um, I sort of threw some slides together and I figured would we'll talk about the levy system first. Um, this is me talking as a reporter, but part of this is my opinion as well from being here. So just so you, know. so you can see this. This is actually a, a flood wall that was built after Katrina to block storm surge from going into um, uh, the uh, industrial ca canal in, in New Orleans. Which you guys saw when we did, we started the Lower Ninth tour over there, yeah. So that wall is uh, 26 feet high, um, and it is designed to be overtopped by a 100-year um, uh, hurricane. And of course, I'm sure you guys know a 100-year event is not a 100-year event. <laughs> it's uh, an event with a 1% chance of occurring in any year. And the way I like to talk about it in the stories is there's a 26% chance of that it, uh, event occurring during the lifetime of a 30 year mortgage. Um, and unfortunately, it's becoming more often. So, so you guys get that, right? I know you guys are homeowners, but you get what we're talking about, right? You buy a house, and usually it's a 30, you get a loan, because you just can't afford to pay that for the house. So you get a loan that you pay back over 30 years. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about. So you guarantee the Well, it, it's it, you get a 26 percent chance of that. 26 percent chance of overtime. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and and that of course is based on <coughs> where where things were that year in terms of um, um, you know sea level rise. And of course, what we're seeing now is significant sea level rise, and it's increasing everything. And the Corps of Engineers right now is reviewing the brand new levy system that was just completed in 2018, officially turned over. Um, they are now reviewing it to elevate it again, to um, keep it at the 100 year level over the next 50 years over time. Uh, and Congress just told them to look at, seeing how successful they might be at elevating it to 200 years. So that would be a significant change. Or doing something to improve the, the, um, the way the city is protected.
to 200 year level. It wouldn't necessarily be elevating the concrete, it could be rebuilding the wetlands and expanding the river. <laughs> stations because um, in, in their wisdom the, the parish government sent the operators to the North Shore for safety in the city and so the pump stations were not operated and uh, the pumps were not designed to have gates on their ends to keep water out so the water backed up through the system and caused some, some flooding but nowhere near as much as in New Orleans. In New Orleans, the problem was that large portions of the levee system were improperly designed or improperly built. Um, everything from uh, the earthen levees were, were, well, the whole system was too low. Um, uh, on the east side of the system, the levees were 15 and a half feet above sea level, when they should have been under the old design, 17 and a half feet above sea level. So the earthen levees in that portion of the system now are 32 feet above the sea level. So you can see the, the significant difference in the design to take into account the fact that the original design was based on past hurricanes looked at in 1959 and 1969 and never moved forward in terms of, gee, Maybe that's not enough to protect us anymore. We should be looking at more intense hurricane potential. Um, in fact, they didn't even, they never did that. They always looked at the past hurricanes never forward. Uh, now they look forward. Uh, so, um, so levees were too low. Some of the levees in that area, in addition to being too low, they had a clay cap built on top of an earthen interior that was basically mucked and taken out of the swamps right next to it. So it was organic material that washed away as soon as the clay cap was gone, washed away as the water over top the levee. Um, the earthen material disappeared and it went from 15 and a half feet to zero. And then stayed that way while the water in that area was high for five to seven days after Katrina hit. So water just kept pouring on in. Um, um, the interior canals, and we'll see some closer images of that a little later. On the interior canals, there were a couple of different issues. Um, the industrial canal, which is a, a, a navigation waterway, uh, there was a big flood wall that was built there that was 15 feet above sea level at its top. The Corps of Engineers, to save money, did not build a concrete splash guard on the protected side of the wall. So when, the, when it was over top with 16 and a half feet of water, he had one and a half feet of water pouring over top down onto the, to the uh, earthen levee that the wall was built into, and a big chunk of the wall just failed. And so then you had a whole flood coming in, a wall of water, that, and that's the lower ninth ward that was over. Um, to the west of that canal, you have three um, drainage canals that had different ways that, that they failed um, that had to do with different odd things. The first one is the London Avenue Canal, which we'll revisit, which was in my story on, on Sunday and last week. Um, that canal, um, people did not understand that beneath uh, a couple of feet of uh, sediment that was on the bottom of the canal was a layer of sand that dated back to the formation of the city of New Orleans 7,000 years ago when it was basically a, a pathway for the Mississippi River going directly east towards the Mississippi coast. Um, and it was 
Um, so the water went through the, the, the sediment, hit that sand, and then burrowed underneath the concrete flood wall because it was beneath, actually beneath the, um, uh, the metal um, sheet pilings that were built in to cut off water. It went below that, cut underneath it, and pieces of the flood wall failed. Um, houses on the other side, people came, who came back found that their houses were built with, and were filled with sand and they couldn't figure out what that was from and it was because it was from that sand layer. Uh, on the western side of the city, um, um, the 17th Street Canal, uh, the problem there was that the flood walls were improperly designed to not cut off the water again. Um, but in this case, it was literally the weight of the water shoved the, the, the flood walls out 35 feet and opened up the big chunk. And so water came from there. And then the, the canal in the middle, there was a fight going on between the Corps and the levee contractor over one segment of levees all the way to the southern end of the canal that was never completed. So there was a hole in the wall and water went through that hole and flooded um, so we had all those things and we had a little bit and it made its way all the way to the rough patch. So all we had left was what we called the sliver by the river, which was the area that did not flood. So that's that's an explanation of the storm. This is what part of the area looked like. Um, and then as they move forward, uh, with redesigning the system, they said, well, this time around, what we're going to do is we're going to take the canals out of the, out of the equation. We're going to be able to build uh, permanent gates and pump stations at the ends of the canals so that water, when, it, when there's a storm surge event, you close the gates, and then water that builds up in the canal behind the gates will be pumped out and into Lake Pontchartrain. And that's my story this weekend was about a problem at one of those, uh, the, the London Avenue Canal gate, where the pumps, one of the pumps was uh, uh, completely corroded and stopped and is being replaced. New pumps. New yeah. pumps. These, are, these are pumps that were built at the completed in 2018. So they're only five years old. You're supposed to have 35 year life time. Um, and the Corps is in the midst of doing a um, research on the rest of the pumps to see if there are any more that have those sorts of problems. Um, so this is the surge barrier. And again, they elevated that surge barrier, but they made it so that it, water could, could go over top of it because of the expense and the um, and the um, engineering issue of building it any higher than 26 feet. It cost a heck of a lot more. And the engineering problem is that the, the, the weight of, a, of a, a structure that high would be very difficult for them to be able to, to deal with. And so they kept it at that height. Um, the idea was that there's enough area behind to take care of that water. We hope that's true. Um, and these are just some shots of, of that wall. Um, on, the, uh, on the west bank, um, those, that levee system prior to Katrina was only 40% complete. And one of the areas was where it was not complete is, is this little area where you have two canals coming together uh, and going south. Uh, exiting into Baratari Bay. Um, that pump station uh, has the ability of draining a, an Olympic sized swimming pool in four seconds. Just think about that. It's a heck of a lot of work. Um, it's huge. And uh, same issues are there. It's, you know, 1% storm is what it's designed for. And we'll see if it, we'll see how well that works. Um, and this is a close-up of that pump station, just to give you a better idea of how big it is. 
Um, this is uh, one of the other issues that we got into a big argument with the Corps of Engineers about literally shouting match in our office was, um, well, you need to, to armor all of the earthen levees. And the Corps uh, basically originally said, well, no, we really aren't authorized to do that. And uh, that was when we started yelling. And, <laughs> and, and said, so explain to me how Congress has authorized you to build this huge levy system for $14 billion, but it's only good until it's over top, and then it doesn't have to be there. And he said, no, 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 that's not what we're saying. And we said, but that's exactly what you just said, because you're saying you don't have to armor them. Their idea of armoring, by the way, also is hopefully, it's one of those hopeful things. Um, it's a, um, a fabric mat, plastic fabric mat, through which grass grows, and that mat will allegedly uh, it's on the protected side of the levee, so when it's over top, the water will run down, but it won't remove that clay. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, the entire levee is built with proper clay, and we stopped them from using, from doing the exact same thing. A couple of weeks after they started building their first levee, uh, both me and an engineer named Bob B. spotted them on the same day. And I wrote a story, and Bob wrote it his complaints and it got stopped immediately uh, and they went back to yeah you're right we need to do this properly and only use the proper kind of clay uh, which costs a fortune by that time um, uh, the, the amount of money it cost for um, that stuff went from five dollars a cubic foot to forty dollars a cubic foot so you can see how significant that that was in terms of increasing so this is a uh, uh, close up of one of the pump stations as it was being built at the ends of the canals. Um, this is, um, I'm not even sure what this map is, so I'm gonna be <laughs> um, This is, uh, uh, if with, with the new levee system complete, this is what happens for a 100 year storm, uh, a 1% chance storm. And it's it's sort of confusing. Um, so that's by the Savage National Wildlife Refuge. All all that is is wetlands, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, on on the bottom. This also is wetlands between the 100-year levy and an interior levy. Uh, it's called uh, the Central Wetlands Unit. It used to be a cypress forest until the, uh, uh, until the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet was built that brought salt water and killed all the cypress. Uh, it, the Gulf Outlet has been uh, dammed off after Katrina, and uh, they're attempting to rebuild that wetland as a cypress forest, which will add protection to the city. And then the other areas are just where interior pumping is not adequate to handle a rainfall event that would occur with the hurricane that would be the equivalent of a 1% storm. There's our sites in the turn, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and this is, you know, worst case event, a 500 year event, which is, you know, basically a category five direct hit on the city. You can see how significant the flooding would be, which is the problem with the levy system. So, the Corps of Engineers makes levy systems, and you guys have seen that with the audience that yeah. recently, where Sacramento was, was um, the worst case. Okay, and then this, Baharo, most Baharo. One, this most recent one was just medium. Both of those have those ratings because of the amount of value behind the levees. Okay, which is why this latest one was only medium. It's because it's mostly farmland in a very small community. City of New Orleans is second worst. 
And that's because there's $200 billion worth of investment behind this levy system, minimum $200 billion, and probably more. So, again, something to think about in terms of the future. Uh, so, this is what a Category 5 hurricane could do today. It's as if the coastline would change. Yeah, well, and, and it, it, it is very similar to that. So that's, you know, so that's, that's the levy system, okay? So now, now we'll go to some of today's events, right? So today the IPCC put out their new report and it included this warning. Pace and scale of climate action are insufficient to tackle climate change, accelerating action required. All the adverse impacts that could occur and it's all temperature. You know, if, we, if, if something happens amazing, some miracle occurs, we're able to keep this at 1.5, we'll have significant changes, but it'll be mostly okay. But anything above that, we, we got no problems. So it's in that context that we're dealing with our, our coastal system. So uh, our coastal system was built uh, by over 7,000 years um, or longer through different locations of the Mississippi River and the Atchafalaya Delta, uh, the interior, uh, Bayou Lafouche, uh, Bayou Terrebonne, um, and then the New Orleans East, which is uh, um, uh, the St. Bernard Deltas, um, and then finally the Birdfoot Delta, which largely is man-made. Um, and uh, as each one of these deltas was abandoned, uh, you start having subsidence and a lack of sediment causing sinking. Um, and as um, the abandonment becomes more than abandonment, becomes cut off from any sediment, it becomes much worse. Uh, and this is a, a better example. Hmm. You know, uh, that's what the historic river system looked like uh, prior to 1880s. Where, where's that? I haven't seen that one. Where's that from? Made that bigger. <laughs> And this is, this is the reality of what it is today, um, which is significant, it's a significant problem. So the state is in the midst of uh, approving its uh, 2023 update of its coastal master plan. Uh, beginning in 2007, it, it created a master plan for coastal restoration and levees. It, pulled a number out of the air of uh, 50 years <clears throat> and $50 billion and said, uh, we will plan for the next 50 years how to spend $50 billion on levees and restoration, half and half. And then we'll update it every five years or six years. Now it's every six years. And this is the latest version of that. So the master plan process uses these uh, that these are your givens, you know, what are you dealing with? Well, you've got two different scenarios of sea level rise that you're dealing with over 50 and greater years. Um, and then you have uh, storm intensity and the potential for change there. Pre precipitation, which is also a significant issue here. Um, and all, all these other things that they have to look at. Um, and the bottom line is, without any action, if they don't do it over the, the next 50 years, all that blue becomes water. That's wetlands that exist today, which is already 2,000 square miles less than in 1930. Um, and that is another 4,000 square miles of wetlands that are in danger of being 
And what that means is this. So those are the flood deaths, or this is a higher scenario, but a hundred year event. This is how high the water can get in a lot of those different areas during the catastrophic event. So they plan, they use this as their basis for planning. Um, and these are their objectives. And there's a lot of, a lot of you don't know what working coast means, but it's a recognition by state government that we are an oil and gas state and we are a fishing state and people need to live on the coast to, to do both of those. And that means not necessarily living behind the lanes. So that's, they have to work that into their system. Uh, and then their cultural heritage, the reality that we're, you know, we're, we're the Cajun nation. Um, and this is how they decided to split up the money on different ways of uh, doing things. Um, you see how, how significant that is. Um, and these are the different, different ways that they're doing it. Uh, barrier Island Maintenance, uh, they have already rebuilt all the barrier islands. They had a huge chunk of money that they got from uh, 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 criminal fines from BP that they used to do that. That was specifically limited to being used for either that or for setting up diversions. So they got all, the, all, all those um, the barrier islands are pretty much complete. Um, BP gave them $360 million in addition to that project of the storm to build berms that ended up becoming their lives on the um, And then there are diversions, which are probably the most controversial of the projects. Um, this basically is sort of a schematic of what, what the nuclear terrain sediment diversion is. Um, the diversions are designed to build land over a longer period of time for less cost, even though their upfront cost is significant. The mid Barataria diversion now is up to $3 billion. Uh, it will begin construction unless a lawsuit stops it, which likely will, um, but it's supposed to begin construction in a couple of months. Um, and, but there are significant problems with these diversions. Uh, it'll take about five years to build, uh, and then when the diversion is in place, it will allow the state, well, it will allow uh, the flow of 75,000 cubic feet per second of water and sediment into Barataria Basin. Um, that amount of fresh water will significantly change the basin. Um, and the changes will uh, change fisheries that are available in the, in the area. It will kill all the oyster beds that are, the existing oyster beds that are there today that are 50 to 60 miles north of where they were 100 years ago. Okay, so that's something else to keep in mind. So can I just explain, so you guys, we haven't really talked about diversions, but we've talked about the seasonal flooding. This is an engineering response to try to mimic that. So instead of the, the flood waters topping over like the freeway or the whatever, it's, a, it's like a straw that we're gonna pop through that or tubes. So you get all the benefits of the sediment rich water dumping over here, but you don't, you don't. It's a, there's a man-made crevasse yeah. is, yeah. is what they call it. Um, and it, that flow is not year-round. Uh, the flow is going to be when the river rises, which will generally be from December through maybe May or June, uh, and then it will be shut off. But it will still have significant effects. So the other, um, the charismatic megafauna, that will be affected are uh, bottlenose dolphins. Uh, there are about 2,400 bottlenose dolphins that live in four pods in this, this uh, basin, the Baratari Basin, and it's pretty clear that they will all die uh, within the first year of the year because of, of fresh water, because they can't take the fresh water amounts that will be there. Um, so, 
the plan itself includes $360 million for uh, mitigation. Most of that money is aimed at fishers and at uh, uh, people who live outside the levy system who may have to see their homes elevated or some other issues for a foot or maybe a little bit more water height when the diversion is up. Um, there's money that's being put towards the dolphins, but no one expects it to be able to do anything while long term, which is one of the unfortunate things. Um, hydraulic, um, hydrologic restoration, there's a significant chunk of money. Basically, rebuilding wetlands in a way, uh, uh, getting rid of the canals that are in there now, uh, breaking down their uh, the berms that are along their sides and restoring the hydrology so that, again, benefits wetlands uh, the way the wetlands are supposed to be uh, operating. Um, uh, land bridges are something that the state is, is emphasizing where they are trying to find areas along the coast to, to be more land and wetlands together as longer um, water bodies of land uh, provide. Again, all of these projects are aiming first at reducing storm surge and then at the environmental potential uh, positives. Um, marsh creation, uh, this is the one that the fishers say we should only be doing. Uh, the, the largest chunk of money actually is set aside for marsh creation today and will be in the future where um, you've got um, uh, uh, sediment is being dredged from the Mississippi River or from the interior open water areas and then it's directly creating new marshes uh, just building them straight out of, out of nowhere. Um, the problem is that they only last about 20 years unless you have more sediment to put on top of them. You have to go back and do the exact same thing every time. And it's very expensive and you get more expensive as the fuel costs of operating those dredges and running the pipelines, some of which are 10 to 20 miles long, um, those will get more and more expensive, which is why they give it the diversions as a longer term potential. Um, the the, the Mid-Barataria diversion uh, at the end of 50 years will is expected to have created and sustained 21 square miles of land, which at that time will equal 20% of all of the remaining wetlands in that basin. So it's pretty significant. Um, as part of several of these projects, they're building bridges, again, um, both as a natural resource uh, because of the potential to have trees and everything that comes along with them, but also for their potential to reduce storm surge, especially from smaller areas um, for interior areas. Um, and then there, there's the levee side. Short term is levy, but it's structural and non structural risk reduction. Um, the non structural risk reduction side um, is basically elevating homes and uh, floodproofing businesses and then identifying homes and businesses that are in 25 year floodplains and, um, and that is an area where they are looking at providing more money to do that. So far as the Corps of Engineers is doing that by looking at areas that need levies and then deciding we're going to build non-structural instead of levies because we'll do that and it will cost us less. Uh, the state insists that it be voluntary, not, uh, not involuntary. So that's one of the limits to it, uh, which has been a problem in the past but likely will not be a problem in the future, especially with um, both uh, mortgage rates and flood insurance rates rising. Um, 
Sorry. Okay. And then, and then, uh, and then the structural risk reduction, and that's levees and flood walls. Um, and there are a number of additional levees that are being um, built across the state. Um, back when all of this started in the 2007 era, there was a lot of talk by um, um, people that they did not want to see the wall of Louisiana, that they didn't want to see levees all the way across the state. In some cases, um, the state and the Corps of Engineers have agreed with that, and in some cases, they found that the only way to deal with some of these risk issues is by, by building levees, and so they're doing that. Um, and this is a map of all the projects that are in this latest version, little dots all over the place. Um, and this is Pontchartrain Brecken, which is basically east of the Or anything beyond any other environmental 